This morning, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, if you will turn to Luke chapter 24, Luke 24. <clears throat> so grateful for the message that Pastor Lacey brought you last Sunday. I had a chance to listen to it this week. Wow, what a powerful, powerful message about the crucifixion of our Lord and the hope that we have in his resurrection. Amen? And today, I want to kind of pick up in the biblical narrative following the resurrection of our Lord and relate that to how sometimes we can also find ourselves in a similar place in life. And this is the story of what's often referred to as the road to Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. In Luke chapter 24, starting with the 13th verse, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, and I think they have it on the screen as well. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. If you've been to, the, uh, to Israel, this is actually seven miles west of Jerusalem. Uh, and most biblical scholars believe that the two followers, uh, we know one was a man named Cleopas. And the second person isn't identified, but most scholars have, uh, have deducted that it is most likely his wife, Mary. And so here is a, possibly, and, and today we'll just go with that information, here's a husband and wife who are making their way from a scene of where Jesus' body is missing. That's all they know. They had been followers up to this point. They had heard Jesus' teachings. They, had, they were familiar with the writings of the prophets. But the last thing that they experienced before this walk, this long walk home, seven miles is a pretty long walk. Before this, this long walk home is that they heard that this man who had been crucified and placed in a tomb was now missing. He was gone. In verse 14, it says, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. Well, what is everything that had happened? Well, they were discussing the fact that this man, who they believed was the Messiah, was now nowhere to be found. And they were confused, maybe upset, maybe angry. They were discussing what may have felt like a huge blow to their spiritual gut. As they could see, all, all they could see is that Jesus had died and now he was missing. In verse 15, it says, as they walked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. And now Jesus shows up, all right? But, verse 16, but God kept them from recognizing him. So in their mind, this was just a man who showed up on this walk home. Verse 17, he asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Now, it's not hard to imagine that Cleopas and Mary were in a state of deep defeat. Imagine yourself having walked with this man possibly for many years, hearing these incredible stories that he was telling and teaching believing all along that this was the long-awaited Messiah that the prophets had told about. And then one day he dies. He doesn't just die. He is crucified and dies. And he is placed in a tomb. And he had said that he would defeat death. But now his body's gone. He's missing. And you had put all of your hopes 
in this man, in his teachings, and now he's nowhere to be found. What would you be feeling at that moment? Probably a sense of defeat. Maybe disillusionment. Maybe anger, frustration, confusion. Well, we do know that this couple were experiencing sadness. It says sadness, despair was written across their faces. All their hopes that Jesus would not die but live again now seem to be empty. Verse 18, then one of them, Cleopas, he replied to this man, to them, this was just an, a man who showed up. <clears throat> he says, Cleopas replies, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. I find that kind of a humorous statement. <laughs> of course, he didn't know he was talking to God. <laughs> you know, It's like, dude, haven't you heard? Where you been? I mean, the news is everywhere. And you mean you don't know what happened? You don't know what we're talking about? And Jesus replies, and he says, what things? The things that happened to Jesus. The man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped. We had hoped hoped he was the Messiah. Not we hope he is the Messiah. We had hope, past tense. So right there it tells us that these people, because, that this couple, because of what they had experienced, they, they've now lost hope. They're not only sad and in despair, they've lost hope. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Their hopes were crushed. Their hopes were crushed. Verse 22, then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see him, uh, ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. And then Jesus replies, You foolish people. What a strange reply. I mean, they were sad, frustrated, hopeless, lost hope, dreams dashed, everything. And then Jesus looks at them and says, you foolish people. What is wrong with you? That's not very compassionate. (laughs) Doesn't seem. But he says, look. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Let me help to make at least some sense and maybe application to this. The emotional state of these two followers of Jesus was based upon what they believed to be true from what others had experienced. Let me say it one more time. The emotional state, sadness, despair, hopelessness, was based upon what they believed to be true from what others had experienced. So their their belief, what they believed, was based upon what Peter told them. I went into the tomb and nobody was there. A body is missing. The women went to the tomb even before that and it's like, 
you know, they came to prepare the body for, you know, lasting burial. And no, the body wasn't there. And angels showed up and all of these things. And everybody is confused. And so these two people were basing their emotional state upon what they believed from someone else's experience. And Jesus says, hey, but didn't you know the truth before this event? So are you going to base your feelings upon what others have experienced to be true or based upon what God said says is true? Are you following me? Everybody tracking with me? We do this so much in life. We do this so much in life. And we become so emotionally out of balance because rather than believing what God says to be true and how to live our life, we base our emotions upon what others think to be true. Making sense? They were basing their beliefs and consequently their emotions on what others told them was true about Jesus rather than what Jesus told them would be true about his death and resurrection and what the prophets had revealed for centuries about him. That's why it is so important, my friends, that we meditate upon God's word rather than man's word. Man's word. I have said this for years, and I just want to say it again since I'm, you're going to be hearing from me more often. Whatever comes out of my mouth, you better go home and test with this word. Don't ever take a preacher <laughs> at his own word. <laughs> all right? That is a dangerous place to be. All right? You want to make sure you test every word, whether it's me, whether it's somebody you're listening to on TV or the radio or in a, in a study group. You want to test it all by the word of God. Amen? That doesn't mean that, you know, what the pastor or whatever is saying is, is, fa is false or untrue or a lie or whatever. It's just that we're flesh too. Amen? <laughs> it's not really something you want to amen, but necessarily, but... We're flesh too. We're just like you. You know, we try to study the, God's word the best we can and bring it to you the best that we can. But we also need to be tested. Amen? So that's what was happening here. Is that this couple who had heard all that Jesus had said for so many years, rather than believing what Jesus said, now they're believing what man said and basing their emotions on what now they believe to be true. There are times in life when our hopes and dreams are dashed <coughs> for various reasons. You may be on your own Emmaus Road right now. You're walking down a road of uncertainty, and emotionally, you have been wrecked. Everything you thought to be true seems to no longer seems to be no longer true. Like the two on the road to Emmaus, maybe you need to need a visit from the Lord to remind you of His truth. Amen? You see, His truth will never fail you. His truth will never, ever fail you. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. And His truth will always set you free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Man's word cannot set you free. There's not a word I can say here this morning that can set you free. Only God's word can set you free. Only what he says is true will truly set you free. Amen. And give you peace and cause you to hope again. Have you ever described yourself 
or someone else as being an emotional wreck? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> if you want to confess publicly, that's fine. Sure, pastor, <laughs> I've been an emotional wreck. We've all probably been there at one time in our life, or we may be there now. When we say that, when we say that, we are typically describing what is happening inside of us. A mixture of emotions is stirring around and often seems out of control. If your car is out of alignment and you let go of the steering wheel, what will happen? <laughs> You're going to go off the road, go in a ditch, right? Crash, burn, injure yourself. Our lives are much like that as well. If we're out of alignment emotionally and we do not have a grip on what is going on inside of us, we too have the potential of running off the road of life, crashing and burning. Happens. So a few years ago, and I think I look back and it was, uh, I think 2013, that was a, that was a time ago. Um, I shared this illustration with the church and came to my mind again. Um, you like dandelions? We were coming out of our driveway this morning, coming to church, and I said, who is the landscaper at this house on this property? I said, Honey, you need to get on the stick. Dandelions are taking over our yard. And so she said, well, today is the only day. I said, oh, you can't work on Sunday? You can't, you can't work on Sunday? So I'm going to get her some gas for the mower after, the church, after church today. <laughs> we got to get rid of them dandelions. They're taking over. You got dandelions taking over your yard? Yeah, yeah, y'all know what I mean. Dandelions. I became fascinated years ago with dandelions. I, I did a study on dandelions. <laughs> Must have really needed something to do that day. Um, they're a nuisance. Um, they can be. I, actually, they have some quality. We won't go into that right now because we're not giving them that much credit today. You ever notice you mow them down one day and they, they, they're back? And Sherry said, amen. You, you mow them down one day and they're back the next, you know, or, or at least a couple days. And, and the reason is, is that you're just whacking them off at the top. And it's like they gain strength and multiply. The more you whack them off, the more they grow. But the problem is not what you see above the ground. You see, the problem is below the surface. The real problem is at the root system, and the way to get rid of those pesky plants is to get them at the root. You got to go to the root. What makes dandelion removal from lawns so difficult? Well, dandelions enjoy the best of both worlds. This is going to be way more information than what you really wanted when you came to church this morning. But above ground, their seeds ride the wind currents, poised to drop into the slightest opening in your lawn to propagate the species. Meanwhile, below ground, dandelions strike down a taproot uh, up to 10 inches long. All right? A taproot. Pulling the taproot as a means of dandelion removal is problematic, however. Thick but brittle the taproot easily fractures, and any fraction of the taproot that remains in the ground will regenerate and multiply and kill your lawn. The best defense against dandelions is what? A healthy lawn. Best defense. Now, my wife doesn't believe that. She thinks a uh, roundup. Go out there and just squirt every single one of them. 
<laughs> you know? We've already been tested for what, what's that disease that round up? Yeah, anyway. Um, a healthy lawn. That's the best way to keep dandelions from overtaking your lawn. Make sure that the grass is healthy and abundant and plentiful. Wherever there's a bare spot in your lawn, you can be assured that a nasty dandelion seed will land there. But in a healthy lawn full of thick grass, you see, that seed will blow, but it will never get to the surface. It will never find soil. It'll land on top of the grass. We came by two lawns this morning. Were you thinking about that, darling? We came by two lawns this morning uh, on our way to church. And one, I mean, it looks like a dandelion farm. <laughs> they, they have literally overtaken everything. And right beside it is the most green, lush. I mean, they're, there's only a driveway, that seven, and they're huge yards. I mean, there's several acres, probably 10-acre lawns. And uh, right beside it is a lush green lawn, and there is not a dandelion one. So here's one full of weeds, and the next one is full of green, lush grass. Somebody's doing something different. Friends, you were created by God to be that beautiful, green, lush lawn. The kind of person that when people see you coming, they have a sense of peace and wonder about you. They don't run for the hills because they're afraid of the seed of bitterness, the seed of offense, the seed of anger that may spread into their lawn. But they see you coming, and they're like, what are you doing to have such peace in times of difficulty, trouble, disappointment, just like these two on the road to Emmaus? We all have bare spots to deal with in our lives. These bare spots may be the result of experiences from childhood or adulthood. They may be the result of our own sin or someone else's. They may be the result of traumas in our lives, such as sexual, physical, verbal abuse. They may be the result of a failure we have never gotten past or maybe a missed opportunity. Possibly these bare spots are the result of failed relationships, such as divorce or an offense between friends. The dandelion has no life unless it finds a place to take root. The dandelion represents the negative experiences we have encountered along life's highway. The two heading to Emmaus, they just experienced a great disappointment. At least they thought. That, I would imagine that was a traumatic three days in the life of followers of Jesus. Can you imagine being there? Seeing the one that you had followed and loved and learned so much from being stripped and beaten and bloodied and hung on a cross and then for, for uh, about two, two of those days, two and a half of those days, being mocked and spat upon as crowds of people walked by, seeing Jesus and the two thieves hanging on the cross next to him, just hanging there and being mocked at and rocks thrown at. I mean, can you imagine the trauma that these followers must have experienced? And then to be put in a grave and then to go back and his body is absolutely missing? The theory of the day is that the Roman soldiers possibly or maybe the religious leaders actually stole his body. And now you don't even have an opportunity to bring customary closure to his death. And now you're walking seven miles back home and you're carrying all this in your heart and in your mind and you're thinking, how do I make sense of this? And then Jesus shows up and says, you foolish people. 
Why have you chosen to believe that rather than what I told you to be true? So often we spend lots of time and energy just whacking off the dandelions in our life so they don't look so bad to others. We try hard to control our anger. But any good counselor will tell you that anger is only what you and others see. It is connected to a belief. And that belief is connected to an experience. Proverbs 4.23 in the, in the King James, modern King James, says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. In other words, guard your heart, my friends. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23 in the uh, NIV says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Jesus said it this way, out of, out of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart comes what comes out of our mouth. In other words, the words that we speak are evidence of what is going on inside. The wellspring of life is here in the heart, inside, what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're choosing to believe. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 15 in the NIV says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So uh, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I had to wonder I wonder if there were, we only know of the two people that were on the way to, uh, to Emmaus, but I'm sure there were others from Emmaus who were traveling around, along the same road. And often in life, there are people who are also traveling these pathways that might be, um, you know, pathways where we're struggling with things, we're dealing with things. And they too can become infected by what we're expressing. What we're expressing. If bitterness is coming out of us, that becomes toxin for those who are around us, who might be vulnerable. They might have a bare spot in their life. And all of a sudden, we just blew seed. We just blew bitter seed over into that bare spot in their life. And now bitterness has a chance to take root. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. In the Message Bible, the same verses, it says this, work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. Right there it is, friend. There's your garden lesson. There's your dandelion verses right here. Let me read that part again. Make sure no one's left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter discontent. Keep a sharp eye out for it. A thistle or two, a dandelion or two, Gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. So we have to guard our heart. Romans 12, verse 2, Paul says in the NIV, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by what you believe. You got to take care of your pumpkin you got to take care of this thing. 
Because what you believe impacts what you feel. What it, it, the consequences of your emotions come from what you put in your head, in your mind. So be, tra- uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, friends, do not conform. Do not conform to this world. God wants us to choose a better way of life than what is found in the patterns of this world. And that's what Jesus was saying to these two on the way to Emmaus. Hey, you foolish people, why are you putting your trust in what man is telling you? Put your trust in what I have said is true. Amen? There's another way of saying don't conform your feelings right now and your emotions according to the patterns of the world. And then he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does a person change according to the word of God? We change by changing what we think or what we believe to be true. You can work the rest of your life trying to change your anger or your bitterness But until you change your mind to believe the truth, then healing will never be fully realized. In the New Living Translation, it says, don't copy the pattern and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Amen? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I was thinking about this this week as I was preparing, and I thought, you know, the inverse of that is also true. And here's what I wrote. If you continue to pattern, if you continue to copy the pattern and customs of this world, you will remain the same and never change. And as a result, you will not learn God's will for you, but rather chase after things that are not good, pleasing, and perfect. A man who ministered in our network for many years and actually just passed away uh, this past year, I believe, Tom Gardner. Tom uh, was kind of a, a specialist in inner healing and prayer counseling and wrote several books. Altar of the Heart uh, was, I think, his first book. Some of you have read that book. But Tom said this in his book, Altars of the Heart. He said, there is a relationship between what we feel and what we believe. Our emotions are not based on what is absolutely true, but what feels true to us. What we feel is the product of what we believe, and what we believe is a product of what we have experienced. The order is experience, beliefs, and feelings. So it's important when we have experiences in life that we make sure that we align our beliefs to what is actually true. And when we align our beliefs to what is true, then our feelings will follow. Does that make sense? So, you ready to do some gardening this morning? Worship team, come on up. So back to my dandelion uh, expertise, experiences, something I have learned about pulling weeds. I don't know why this escaped me for so long, but do you know when the best time to pull a weed is? After it rains. After it rains, you know why? Because the ground gets soft and you can get down. You want to get, because those dandelions are very brittle. Go home and try to pull one today. It hasn't rained much. Go on, you're just going to break it off at the surface. Now, it'll look good on the surface, but underneath, there's still a tap root. That tap root of evil is still there. All right? After it rains for a couple of days, you know, get the ground really so You can go out there and get right down as, as, as far as you can to the ground, and you just twist gently and and pull at the same time and man it it's just so gratifying (laughs) it is so gratifying i mean a taproot will come out you know maybe depending on the size of the of the plant you know four to 
to 10 inches long and so satisfying, and, and it's done. Has no chance to grow again. It's done. It's done. And so the best time to pull weeds in your life is also when you are soaked in the Holy Spirit. The reign of God. The reign of God. When we get in a tough place and we, we've got bitter roots growing up in our life, the best thing we can do is get under the shower of the Holy Spirit, the shower of God's Word, and let it begin to just soak us, just absolutely soak our lives. And then the Holy Spirit, we surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit, and God will reach in and say, let me have that root. And we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's when we separate ourselves from God in our bitterness, in our anger, in our hopelessness, in our despair, it's when we separate ourselves that then things in our lives begin to get a bit dry. The ground gets a little hard. And then people start coming to us and it's like, you know, are you doing okay? Yes, I'm doing fine. <laughs> okay, I was just asking. Um, be good if you notify your face how your heart apparently is doing. But anyway, that's your life. <laughs> but people know. And then because we're trying to do ground control in our life, we're just whacking things off, pretending that nobody can see. And you see, we're spiritual people. We see with spiritual eyes. And we see something ain't right. Something ain't right. There's a, there's a bitter root. And so... We don't want to be judgmental toward each other. We want to then begin to soak that person in prayer. Begin to pray and begin to intercede and pray that they will get under the shower of the Holy Spirit and let God reign in their heart and uproot that stuff. Look, we all have roads to Emmaus. We all have experiences that sometimes result in a long walk home but we don't have to walk home bitter. We don't have to walk home hopeless. We don't have to walk home in despair. We don't have to walk home believing a lie. So, oh foolish people of us, let us believe in what he says. It's true. Amen? Stand to your feet. Father?